What is grace? Grace is community. Grace is passion. Grace is for everyone. For freedom Christ has set us free. Stand firm, therefore, and do not submit again to a yoke of slavery. You who want to be justified by the law have cut yourselves off from Christ. You have fallen away from grace. For through the Spirit, by faith, we eagerly wait for the hope of righteousness. For in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision counts for anything. The only thing that counts is faith working through love. You were running well. Who prevented you from obeying the truth? You were called to freedom, brothers and sisters. Only do not use your freedom as an opportunity for self-indulgence. But through love, become slaves to one another. For the whole law is summed up in a single commandment. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. If, however, you bite and devour one another, take care that you are not consumed by one another. Two. Then Peter came to Jesus and said to him, Lord, if another member of the church sins against me, how often should I forgive? As many as seven times? Jesus said to him, not seven times, but I tell you, 77 times. The word of the Lord for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Will you join me in prayer? Lord, may we be an inclusive community, passionately following Jesus Christ. Open our hearts to your word on this 4th of July. May we find true freedom today as we commit ourselves to the principles of your kingdom. Amen. I know it's a little unusual to have a sermon by video, but I'm grateful to be with you here on this 4th of July Sunday, even if it is by video, and uh, I pray that this will be a blessing to you. Uh, we have some great speakers lined up for the rest of the year, and uh, let's, let's jump in today. Today we explore one of life's more vexing problems. Inevitably in life we come across someone who does harm to us, sometimes on accident, sometimes on purpose. The harm can be physical or emotional done in public or in private, but what it leaves behind is a woundedness that can be difficult to heal. How do we get free from these things? How do we find peace in the midst of painful life experiences? Today we look at forgiveness in the context of the freedom that it gives us. A few years ago, uh, something very strange happened to me. I got a letter in the mail from my bank that they were revoking the funds from a check that I had deposited and were charging me an administrative fee for it. So I called up the local bank and got as many details about the check as possible. And here's what I found out. The check had been issued not by the church as a paycheck to me, not by a family member or friend, not as a gift from someone. The check was actually from the state of New Jersey. I realized I had been required to serve on jury duty a couple of months before this. At the end of the two days of service, the state kindly informed me that they would be compensating me with a check in the mail worth five dollars. It's good to know that my time is worth so much money. Uh, when the check finally arrived, I deposited it in my bank account, and now, weeks later, they were telling me it, it had been revoked, and I was being charged a fee for trying to deposit funds that were not available. After I understood the story properly, I asked the obvious question to the banker. I said, are you telling me the state of New Jersey is broke? And the manager on the phone responded, it appears to be the case. Now, I have a checkered history when it comes to government agencies. I don't like the long list of rules and the tiny details that you have to follow with their agencies. Every once in a while, I get something in the mail that says, I didn't follow one of their tiny rules, and I am being charged an administrative fee because of it. So when I realized it was the government that was in the wrong, that they had written me a bad check, I immediately thought to myself, how do I charge them an administrative fee? I wanted to get back at them. I wanted to get even. 
I wanted retribution for all those times they did it to me. It's a very human thing to want. There was even a study at UCLA in 2008 that showed fairness is hardwired into our brains and being treated fairly is a basic human need. So when the government wronged me by issuing a check when they had no money to give me, it's only normal that my first reaction is to do the same thing to them that they had done to me. Lucky for me, I had a wife that had far more important things for me to do around the house than for me to scheme at how to get back at the government. She helped me see the light, uh, but what I wanted was what I thought was justice. I wanted things to be even again, because the other option available to me is to let them off the hook. We might call that mercy, to just let them go, let something go. I submit to you that I am not alone in wanting justice. I think most people in my situation would want justice instead of mercy and letting them off the hook. Here's why I think that. My wife Emily is a part of a book club, and once they were reading a book about a husband who had cheated on his wife, the second woman became pregnant, and the husband, realizing how wrong he was, told her, get an abortion, then returned to his wife and was a model husband from that point on. All this happens without the wife ever finding out. Uh, then years pass, and the wife finally does find out about how the husband had cheated on her. So what does she do? What does she want? She wants to get even. She was cruel, she was vindictive, and she did everything she could to hurt him for what he had done. Now here's the interesting thing to me. There was a huge debate in Emily's book club about what the appropriate response should be. Most of the women in the group thought the wife was completely justified in her actions. There were just a couple of ladies who thought mercy should be shown and that his behavior after the incident had proved that he was a different person. So here's what I want us to consider. What happens to the wife when she is cruel and vindictive? She does cruel things to another human being. And what happens to the husband? Naturally, he is pushed further away from his wife. Hurts like these, like what the man did to his wife and what the wife did back to him, I think are sort of like rocks. Some of the things people do to each other are very small, just pebbles that might be slightly uncomfortable. Maybe it's a white lie, a small jabbing insult, or a look of disgust towards another person. But others can be much bigger, a heavy burden to us. Uh, a bald-faced lie, screaming at a spouse or loved one, hurling insults like grenades at another person, or even cheating. These kinds of sins, when added up together, can become an unbearable load. It's not just unbearable for those who do the sinning, either. When someone does something against us, and we hold on to it, it is a heavy burden that weighs us down. We do injury to ourselves when we hold on to these things. So when we look at the story from the book club and the response from most of the moms, I hope what you see are rocks weighing down both people, both groups, the cheating husband and the injured wife. Neither is righteous. We do injury to ourselves when we hold on to those things. So when we look at the story from the book club and the response from most of the moms, this seems like maybe what's going on here, neither are in the right, neither do what is truly to the, to the world's benefit. In our scripture reading this morning, we hear Jesus giving instructions about what to do when someone in the church sins against you. Peter comes to Jesus and asks him, how many times do I need to forgive a person? And Jesus says, not seven, but 77 times, or 70 times seven. He is essentially saying, never stop forgiving a person. Never hold on to the sins that others perpetrate against you. Never let those rocks pile up and be a burden to you. 
These are wonderful words. They point us in a freeing, life-giving direction. But the problem is, how do we do it? How do we actually live a life where we let go? How can we have people do such terrible things against us and choose mercy instead of what we think of as justice? Here's a very practical approach you can use. First, remember your own faults. Remember how you too have done things that have hurt others. We can't point out everyone else's faults and ignore our own in the process. Second, assume the best about the other person. I see a failure to do this over and over. Couples do this, parents with their children, friends that have now become enemies. They assume the worst in the other person. But that just stacks the deck against them. That's rocks piling up on them. When you assume the worst, you'll likely get the worst. It means you'll interpret every kind act as some kind of twisted attack against you. Instead, assume the best so you can see the best in another person. Third, pray for them. Go to God because it's God that knows their circumstances and can make a difference in their lives. While you're using this approach of remembering your own faults, assuming the best in others, and praying for them, you'll notice something else too. You aren't seeking what we usually call justice. You aren't trying to get even with them anymore. And you also aren't trying to just let them off the hook by showing mercy to everyone in every situation. Instead, what you are seeking is a third way, one I would call redemption. Redemption means things are truly made right. Seeking this third way can feel quite unnatural. I come from a family that said you should always show mercy to everyone without question. And it wasn't until a few years ago that I even began to question that mentality. I was at my brother's house for a birthday party and was sitting next to my uncle. I have a lot of respect for my uncle, who's also a pastor of a church. And when we sat down together, the conversation quickly turned to politics and religion. But that's when my uncle said something wholly unexpected. He told me that he doesn't believe that we are supposed to forgive people who wrong us and don't repent. I brought up multiple biblical examples that I understood to have a contrary meaning. This passage from Matthew 18, Jesus on the cross forgiving everyone even though they don't understand what they are doing. Yet to this day, I have held in my heart what he said back then. And it is only in preparing for this sermon that I think I understand a little bit better what he meant and why what he said is so important. See, forgiveness is an incredibly powerful act. Forgiving someone has the power to make things right that were not right before. Forgiveness can draw a person to repentance and ultimately to redemption, but it cannot do these things if it is given without discrimination. I'm sure many of you are familiar with the five stages of grief. This is a very ordinary experience that helps us go from stunned denial of a person's death to eventual acceptance of its reality. I think in a similar way, there is a process we go through when someone sins or sins against us. And whatever side of the act we are on, we need to go through that process. Maybe some grieving and processing what happened to us in order to find redemption. For the one who sins, they need to understand that they have done something wrong, that there are consequences for wrong behavior, and that forgiveness can only happen after an appropriate period of time passes. Sometimes it may only be a few minutes or a few days, but for some of life's most tragic situations, it may be many years before forgiveness can happen. On the other side, for those who have experienced pain from the decisions of others, don't hold on to it for a second longer than you need to. Unload those rocks. Get rid of them as quick as you can so you are free to forgive 70 times 7. But don't be a punching bag for abuse either. Don't let someone ignore their obligations to you. 
If you give mercy to someone before it is appropriate, you have only enabled wrong behavior. So the goal is to find that third way. Find a course that leads to redemption for the people around you. So that you and all those you come across in life's journey can experience God's love in right relationship with him. Adam Hamilton tells a story about an incident that became a boulder in a man's life. A man's son went to a party on New Year's Eve at a nightclub with his roommate. Afterward, the group went back to their apartment where the son and roommate got into a fight and someone called the son's brother to come and help break it up. So the brother did. He broke up the fight. Then the roommate went into his room, got a gun, and came back shooting and killing the brother that broke up the fight. The son held his brother in his arms as he died. The roommate was tried and sentenced to prison, but the father, the father just couldn't get over the death of his son. He cried out to God through tears and sorrow, help me, help me make something good come from this evil. Over time, the father let go of his right to retribution, to justice. He prayed not only for his own healing, but for his son's killer as well. He tried to see the roommate's humanity and assume not that he was a horrible person, but an ordinary one who had made a terrible decision that night. Now, the father volunteers to work with prisoners. He has shared his story with hundreds of people behind bars, and that through Christ, he has let go of his hate and resentment. This is the goal for each of us. We forgive in a relentless way because it frees us. And when we are made free, we can do what we were created to do. Serve each other in love, as Galatians says. You could take your freedom and you could fight for what the world calls justice. You could take your freedom and let people walk all over you. But you were made free so that you could love others and draw them to the life that God has for them. God wants to redeem us. So be free. Forgive others so you aren't carrying heavy burdens. And then aim for real justice. Justice that redeems people by drawing them to Jesus Christ. It starts by you making that commitment here today. And by committing to this kind of life We change our community, our neighborhood, which could change our nation and eventually the whole world. So be free. Free so you can serve God and draw others to redemption as well. Amen? Amen. For everything happening at Grace, check out our website at gumc.org.